Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to all the souls that are on the other side and the famous ones that made things happen. And we're brought to you every Sunday on the Parix Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host. I'll be speaking the words of our wonderful spirit guest tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. Tonight, we're going to bring you a show dedicated to the future of organized religions. We will be channeling three great religious leaders from the past, Martin Luther, the Prophet Muhammad, and St. Francis of Assisi. Martin Luther was ordained to the Catholic priesthood in 1507. He came to reject several teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. For his views, they excommunicated him in 1521. He became the leader in what was become known as the Protestant Reformation, with the Lutheran Church being named after him. He challenged the authority of the Pope and believed that the Bible was the only source of divine, who believed that the Bible was the only source of divine light, light, knowledge. I promised people I did not have anything to drink with dinner tonight. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad was born in 570 A.D. in Mecca, Arabia, and was the founder of the Islam faith. At the time of his birth, the tribes of Arabia worshipped various idols or deities. He united many of these tribes and formed a religion whose teachings were incorporated into the Quran and the Hadith. Today, many of the adherents to the faith practice Islam as it was practiced in the 7th century and have shown little adaption to modern times. We will investigate what the Prophet sees as the future for Islam. For the past several years, the Prophet has blessed us with multiple channelings in which he gave us many messages concerning his recommendations for the modernization of Islam. We've published his message in soft cover and ebook formats now available on Amazon. We're honored to have the spirit of the Prophet with us again today. St. Francis was born in 1181 A.D., he was born in a wealthy family, but decided to live a life of poverty after being ordained. He founded the Franciscan Order of Monks. He dedicated his life to spreading the words of God as written in the Bible and contributed to the growth of the Catholic Church. Francis has believed in the sacraments of the Church. He always did, such as the Eucharist. He also felt God is reflected in nature and is considered a patron saint of animals. St. Francis is one of the most highly regarded figures in the Catholic religion. Okay, I would like to thank all of you for tuning in to our show. Now, we try to bring you information based on our ability to speak with the spirits. You can hear all of our shows on our YouTube channel or download them on Podomatic.com. Now, tonight, I think our disclaimer is going to be very important. Wise people say never discuss politics or religion. And tonight our show is going to focus on religion. So the opinions or statements voiced on our, on our show are the channeled words of the spirits. Do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Now we currently have over 410 videos available on our YouTube channel. It's in my name, Barry Strome. You'll find all of our channeling history shows there, as well as our other channelings. Last week, we had an interesting interview with the spirits of Archangel Azrael, Sigmund Freud, and Robin Williams. We discussed death, what happens when you die, the journey of the soul to heaven, and the penalties for suicide. Death is something we all will face, and knowledge of what happens will prevent fear. Now, when we begin channeling tonight, Connie will ask the questions, and I'll answer those questions in the words of the spirits. But before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. So Connie's going to say the prayer, and we will begin to channel with our wonderful guests. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. 
Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seeing, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay. We are not planning on having a break again tonight, so we bring as many of the words of advice as possible from these uh, wonderful religions, religious spirits. So, Connie, let's begin with the discussion, and we'll begin with speaking with the Prophet Muhammad. Prophet, thank you for joining us again. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I would. I would like to thank you so much for allowing me to speak once more. When I walked the earth, it was a very difficult time. I had to do things that I wish I did not have had to do, but I was successful in spreading my words to the tribes, spreading my words to any of those that would listen. Today, the Islamic faith is a wonderful faith. Those that follow my true words are and my beliefs of the times are very peaceful and loving people. Admittedly, there are those that look more to the violence. There are those that still abuse women. There are those that do not do things that will allow our faith to advance as I would like it. So, Connie, I know you have some questions, so... Let's begin. Thank you. Was it your intention that the Quran and Hadith have no provisions for changes through time? Keep in mind that I had no idea that my words would be so important for so many through time. I was trying to bring my people together. I was trying to have them follow the one God. I was trying to do many things. I wound up having to fight wars. I had to protect my people. I had to do many things, as I said. I did not realize that every word that I spoke or that people thought that I spoke would be written down. Very few words were written in my lifetime, so I really had no idea what was going to take place in the future. Had I known, I would have handled things a little differently. But no, I did not have any provisions for the future of the church. Does every word of the Quran reflect the words that you spoke in life? No, many of the words that are in the Quran and Hadith are based on what people thought that I said. It's based on Sometimes what people hope that I said, and sometimes it's based on words that I never spoke. So the intent of the words and of the people writing in the Quran, they had wonderful intent, but human nature is frail as our memories. That is true. Do you believe Islam can adapt to modern times under the wordings of the Quran and Hadith? I think if you took a very, very liberal definition of my words and applied them to what people feel modern times need, that you could, that the words could be used. I've been trying to give you in my channelings modern words, how I really felt, and I tried to give you words that I feel can lead my religion into the future. There are many things that have changed since the 7th century. Of that you can be sure. Today, there are technologies that we never in our wildest dream could have ever imagined. There are weapons available. There are many, many things. There's much evil in the world. The teachings do not need to be changed, but they do need to be adapted. What do you consider the most critical changes that must be made in Islam to allow the religion to grow in the future? I think one thing that has to take place is that people cannot pursue jihad in my name. 
they cannot have great violence towards other religions. Any religion today, in order to succeed, has got to have flexibilities in it. Many people have differences of opinion. Many people live lives much differently. In order for the, for one thing, and most importantly for the religion to succeed in the future, is they have to allow women to have rights. In my day, women weren't educated. They were basically in charge of households. They were to bear children. Today, women are capable of being highly educated. They are intelligent. They are equal to any man. Our religion has to face the equality of men and women for one very, very important thing. Do you think that the religion can prosper and move on if they don't make those changes about women's rights? No. Women have much powers today. Women influence their husbands. Women will not pursue a religion where they're not treated with equality. Why would a woman enter a religion if she was to be, go- be regarded as a piece of property or as a secondary citizen? Women are great assets. They're brains. They are highly intelligent. They bring a different point of view than what a man brings to a situation. In order for the faith to advance, women have to be granted as an equality. Prophet, what do you think is the greatest deterrent to bringing new members into the faith? Many people, many of the prophets in my faith have misinterpreted my words. In my time, things were different. We had to force people. We had to be able to persuade them not to leave the faith, not to fight against us. I think one of the most important things that people need to do is understand that if an individual wants to leave the faith, that it's not right for them, that they should not be killed for wanting to leave that faith. It is common sense that an individual would not want to join a religion where if they found it was not suitable for them and wanted to leave, that their lives would be endangered. I think that is one of the most important things that we can do. I think that we have to encourage free thought among our church members. We cannot force them into a single belief. People today are highly educated, which they weren't in my time. We have to respect that, and we have to have changes that will reflect those changing educations and times. Many individuals believe that Islam is a faith that promotes violence, especially towards Christians. What would you have to say to those individuals? Sadly, I would say in instances they are correct. If they live in certain countries, such as Afghanistan, they will be threatened. There are countries in the world today where people, under the pretext of doing it under the Islamic faith, are killing Christians, they're persecuting them, they're doing many things to them. They're doing the same to other religions. There are many that feel that the Islamic faith is the only faith and that all other people, their lives have no no value. That has to change. There has to be love between all religions. There has to be understanding and There has to be faith in the teachings of the one God, the simple teachings of love, anti-violence, anti-anger. Anyone in our faith that is practicing that is endangering our future. Okay, as we've been talking, there are Muslim fundamentalists that believe in jihad, no education for women, death to anyone leaving Islam, etc. How would you convince those individuals that the faith needs to be modernized? It is incredibly difficult. There are people out there that are being angered simply by hearing my words tonight. It is very difficult for them to understand that times have changed. They have been raised in the belief of the faith, and it's going to be very difficult to change their minds. 
What has to take place is the education of the young. The young members of our faith have to understand that things have truly changed since the 7th century, and what worked in those days will not work today. Common sense, love, understanding. That is what is required if our religion is going to advance. Your faith is deeply divided between the Sunni and the Shia. Do you see any way to end this split? I cannot tell you how sad this makes me. Immediately upon my passing, things started to happen that separated our faith. And for well over a thousand years, the two branches of our faith have been in severe disagreement and often having violence upon each other. I would tell them simply what I just said. They need to focus on love and understanding. If they would sit down and discuss the differences that they think they see in our faith and work out a compromise, I think they would find that there is really very little difference. I spoke of one set of commandments that were given to me from God or Allah. If they would take time to understand the simplicity of the true statements, then I think that they could bring themselves back together. Okay. Can Islam exist far into the future if the split is not healed? It will be very difficult. Although it has existed for over a thousand years, modernization of people's thinking is going to make it much more difficult. And if they turn to violence, it will be a terrible thing. Prophet, what do you see as the requirements for any religion to grow and prosper in the future? They have to show love. They have to show understanding. Any religion to grow has got to attract the young. The young have got to understand that there is a single God and to follow his path is the best for them. If they do not follow such a path, then the growth of any religion will fail. The young have got to understand that all individuals are created equally. They have to understand that if a religion follows the words of God, then that should have appeal for them and their families, and all of their descendants. What do you think is the greatest danger to the growth of organized religions? I think the greatest danger is when a religion becomes a be-all and end-all. Any religion has got to understand that it is a light to help guide people to the understanding of the words of God. If the religion becomes more important, if people in, in those religions are looking for power, for wealth, then it becomes a very difficult thing for them to have the abilities to draw the young into the church. Prophet, thank you so much for joining us again. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. I, once again, thank you. But I want everyone to understand that the Islamic faith is, as I intend, a faith of love, understanding. I would hope that all of the individuals that are listening would teach their young that there is but one God, that the simple teachings of that God are the same to all faiths of the world, that violence should not be shown to any other faith, that cooperation between all individuals is what is required. I can assure you that when you are on this side, that all people are created equal. There is no difference. Skin color doesn't matter. Language, country of origin, belief, that is all. When you return over here, that is all behind you. That is the goal for people that are living human lives, that they have to understand that the faith is the same. The love of God is the same. That souls are equal. That souls have everlasting lives. And that people 
have simply got to understand that they must solve their differences. Violence is not the answer. Hatred is not the answer. The only true answer, and the answer for all religions, is love. I hope that any individuals listening would take time to read my messages. I know that Barry has introduced them in book form. They are available. I have great love for Barry and Connie. They have shown me the the greatest respect in all the time that I've spent with them. I know that they are speaking words counter to what many people believe that I spoke, but you can rest assured that I am truly the spirit of the prophet. I am the spirit that has created the Muslim faith, and I am the spirit that can lead any members of my church or my religion back to Allah. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Now we have Martin Luther to speak with. Martin, would you like to begin with the message? Absolutely. In my time, I was a true follower of the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church. Keep in mind, when I lived, there was but a single religion. The Pope was all-powerful. The Pope said that he was a descendant, that he was, spoke the words of God. The Pope, the leader of the Catholic Church in those days, was all-powerful. There were many things that, as I learned more about the church, that I became disenchanted with. I did not truly mean to break from the church, but the church broke me from the church, and you can see the progress that has been made since that. I lived a very difficult in a very difficult time, but... I was true to my convictions and to my beliefs. I hope that all of you out there will be true to your beliefs as well when it comes to religious matters, and I can assure you that there truly is a God. How you worship that God is how you will live your life. So thank you for having me, and I too am ready for questions. Okay. One of your differences with the Catholic Church was over the concept of indulgences. What was an indulgence? The church came up with ways to raise money. They made they tried to make people more dependent upon the sacraments of the church and they would charge to use those sacraments. The church became the medium that would become the gatekeeper to heaven but only if you paid money to enter that gate. The pathway to God is not a toll road. The pathway to God is a free path for people using their own free will. I found that the practice of indulgence was so repugnant that I would write documents about how bad it was, and I inflamed the anger of many in the church. Did you base all of your religious beliefs on the Bible? Basically, the Bible was the core of our belief system. Keep in mind that things were much different. I did not have access to many of the documents and writings that you have today. When you became a monk or an ordained representative of the church, The Bible was the document upon which you based everything. In my youth, I felt that the Bible was 100% correct, and those were the words that I followed. The Gospels were the foundation. Everything was built upon that foundation. The writers of the time would often rewrite segments of the Gospels. I did not realize that. The Gospels, as I learned, reflected a lot of human opinion about what Jesus would have said, should have said, and probably didn't say. But yes, I based all of my teachings upon the Bible. 
There were many Gospels that were not included in the Bible. Did you ever believe any of these Gospels that differed from what was in the Bible? I had access to some once I got out of the monastery, but I did not truly understand what was truth and what was fiction. I felt that the Bible was divinely inspired, and I felt that because of that inspiration, the words of the Bible were what should be followed. Could you tell us about what led up to your excommunication? I irritated the Pope. He did not feel that my my studies were correct. He did not feel that the words I was speaking were conducive to the church, to the teachings of the church. And he had the power to have me thrown out of the church, and he did so. As you watch from the other side, Martin, what is your thought about the Catholic Church today? I'm saddened by what I watch from the Catholic Church. The abuse that the young went through at the hands of the priests was was incredibly saddening for us. The church has gone astray in many areas. The church has not liberalized in areas where they should, and they have liberalized in areas where they should not. The Catholic Church, the people are incredible people. They, they hunger for the words of God. The words of God should not be tempered by the beliefs of the Pope. There is only a very simple path to heaven, one of equality, no violence, love. Those are the words that should be spoken. Until the Catholic Church understands that they have to attract the young, when they do their their preaching in Latin, no one understands that the young are turned off. Nobody studies Latin today. Things need to be modernized. They have to focus on the younger generation. They have to make the Catholic Church an organization that the young want to be a part of. The young have got to feel that they can participate. They can feel that they will not be punished. They have to understand that if they do wrong, that it is not an eternal sin, that they have to use the church to find forgiveness. They have to realize, the young have to realize, that for any religion to prosper in the future, they have to have a path that the young wish to follow. They need to open their minds, and they need to consider the needs of the youth that are coming to them. They have to make the church a place where the young want to exist, where they want to live, where they want to believe. The church must lead individuals. They must lead them with love and kindness. They cannot force them to follow their do- the doctrines that they do not agree with. Individuals will leave as they have been leaving. That is true. There are many forms of the Protestant religions today. Let's start by asking what you think of the current Lutheran Church, and what do you see as, see as its long-term prospects? The Lutheran Church has many of its practices in a very close relationship to the practices of the Catholic Church. In many instances, I think the Lutherans have got to liberalize more of their beliefs. I think what I said earlier about what the what the Catholic Church needs to do in many ways also applies to the Lutheran Church. The Lutheran Church has a wonderful foundation, and has led many, many people to heaven. 
the leadership of the Lutheran Church at times has been more worried about their own personal power and their own personal futures than they have for the future of the church. The leaders of the Lutheran Church must also understand that it is only through the youth that they can continue to grow. The church needs to reassess how they interact with the young. They have to they have to liberalize their services, have music that appeals to the young, have young preachers. The up-and-coming ministers have got to not be aloof. They must associate. They must have conversation with, and they must truly lead the young. Do you see any Protestant church that is in true harmony with the teachings of Jesus? There is no church that is in the true harmony or teachings of Jesus. That reason being that the teachings have been changed in the Bible. The Gospels have been altered. People have put their own personal opinions into the, into the Gospels. There's no true source of information into what Jesus actually spoke. So, no, there is no, rel- there is no religion that truly reflects the words of our Lord. Which one would you say comes the closest to the teachings of Jesus? The ones that there are the ones that come closest to the teachings of Jesus are the ones that follow his simple messages as you know them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not rely upon the sacraments of the church. Do not believe that the church is the only path to heaven. Religions that follow those commands are the ones that come closest to his teachings. But there is no one single religion that comes closest. Uh, Many religions are losing members. What do you see as the main cause religions are losing these members? As people can become more educated, they understand that there are fallacies in the Bible. Technology in particular tends to lead people away from believing in God. Technology should, in fact, lead you to believe in God. But there are many professors, there are many teachers that have come to the conclusion that there is no way that a God can exist. They will not truly understand until the day they finally close their eyes, but they will come to a true understanding. If you do not cater to the young, to the way they believe, and to the way that they want to understand God's words, then your church will fail. It's pretty much that simple. Our future always lies in the hands of the youth. Yes. Do you think that evil's growing or that religions are driving out their members? Evil is helping religions to drive out their members. The more that they speak the teachings that are obviously difficult to believe or to comprehend, the more they will drive their members away. The more they force individuals to donate money in difficult times when they're having trouble feeding their their families, the more that they tell their members that there's only one path, the more that they teach about the horrors of hell, which does not exist, the more that they do these things, the more they will drive their members away. Do you think organized religions will exist in the future? I think they will. I think they will be in a far different form than they are today. I think they will more closely associate with the daily beliefs and understandings of the people. I think they will reflect a better understanding of what the words of of Jesus actually were. There are many people today that are actually thirsting 
that want to hear the words of God. They want to hear words that they can believe in. They want to hear words that they can follow. And they want to hear words that they can clearly understand. When you teach the parables of the Bible, you're speaking against what Jesus spoke. He spoke very simply. He spoke to the uneducated. Religions in the future are going to have to have simple messages of love. They're going to have to work with other churches. They're going to have to work with the communities. They're going to basically have to be servants of the people. There have to be servants that will help lead people on their path to truly understand and to find God. What do you think is the greatest danger to the growth of the organized religions? I think the greatest danger is among the leadership of the churches. I think that today many church leaders are more interested in making money. They're more interested in their personal fame. They're more interested in how many, shall we say, I guess you call them hits that you get on the social media. I think that the leadership of the churches have got to gain a new flexibility, a new understanding that will lead their constituents into the future. People are not stupid. I think they understand when evil has taken over situations, and they are, I think they have a much better understanding of the common sense of the words that God spoke. Which Protestant religion do you think has the greatest chance of prospering in the future? The church that does the greatest job of association with its memberships, does the greatest job of teaching the simple messages of Jesus, a church that adapts to the understanding and beliefs of the young, a church that will offer the young the opportunity to advance, to learn about God, to follow the teachings of Jesus, and to understand the true aspects of the soul. Most churches do not speak of the fact that souls reincarnate, that they have individuals have life plans. There are many things that the churches will not speak of because it will tend to weaken the position of the church. When churches truly speak of what goes on in the world around them, then they will truly have the opportunity to prosper into the future. I see many churches that are totally incapable of doing that. There are some. I think that the Lutheran Church would have the ability to do of, of what I am speaking. But there are many, many churches that want their parishioners to believe that they are the only path to heaven. Those churches are not going to change. They will only change when their membership leaves them. Yes, God himself said to us one time that if someone tells you that their way is the only way to heaven, you should turn around and go the other direction. <laughs> and he, you're saying the same thing. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Do you have a message for our listeners? Yes. I want all of my listeners to understand that God truly exists. I want them to understand that they are in charge of their own path to heaven. I want them to understand that they will go to heaven. They will be judged for the way they live their lives. I, went, I would hope that everyone that is listening to me today would take time to lay out a path for helping others. Charity is one of the most important things of which our Lord speaks, the helping of others. Help everyone to understand that the soul has everlasting life. Help those that have doubts to truly live beyond those doubts. There is no reason for them not to understand the miracles of God. It starts with the wonderful world in which we live. It starts with a newborn baby. 
It starts with all of the miracles that could not possibly take place without the existence of a God. Look into the nighttime sky and see all the stars and the planets. How do you think all of those would come? There is no way. Important things can be accomplished by every individual. Important things can be in everyone's life plan, from the simplest person. Lay an example for others. Teach the young. You have heard reportedly how the young are so important for the future. That is the truth. The young are the way to the future. They all need to believe and understand the path of of God, of, of the simple words our Lord spoke, of the truth involved with showing love and understanding, the truth of not showing violence, the truth of not showing anger. So I thank you very much for allowing me to come through once more. I'm always here when you ask. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, our last guest is St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to begin with a message? I have listened to the words of those that have come before me, and I am impressed with the truth and the honesty of which, with which they speak. They have wonderful knowledge. They know of the truth of God. They know the miracles of heaven because they are here. They are living. They are in the highest realm, so they know. that they, they know God. They know his presence. They feel his energies. These Wonderful men have been instrumental in forming the lives of millions of people. When I lived, it was also a difficult time. The Catholic Church was the be-all and end-all. I believed in the Catholic Church. I believed that they were the, the only path to heaven. I believe that their sacraments were the only way that an individual would ever gain access to the gates of heaven. I believe there was a hell, a burning place. That is what all the teachings told me. That is what I believed. So thank you. I hope that I can live up to your expectations. Oh, I'm sure you will. You did the last time we had you on. Now that you're on the other side, do you still consider a life of poverty important to serving God? No. In my time, it was felt that sacrifice that emulated the crucifixion of our Lord was required. Our Lord lived a very simple life, and it was our belief that emulating everything that was done by our Lord would help lead you through the gates of heaven. Now that I'm on this side, I understand that it is how you live your life, what you do for others. A life of poverty can stop you from helping others. In the modern society, it's necessary that individuals follow the way of money. Money is what helps individuals to do good things for others. You can, do, you can physically help. In my time, you would help them put a roof on a home or build a house or do physical labor. Today, you can channel funding through charities. You can help individuals do many things. But poverty can actually stop you from doing much good in this world today. So no, the life of poverty, I do not recommend as a way of life. What would you tell our listeners about the importance of charity? Charity is one of the most important things of which God wants you to participate. He wants you to help others. He wants you to to do all of the things 
that Jesus did when he walked the earth. He helped others. He cured. He did miracles. He did many things. Charity is what will help you rise in the realms of heaven. If you accumulate great wealth and do nothing for others, then you will be judged negatively when you return. God blesses you and allows you to make this wealth. It is your choice and your free will how you use it. What is your opinion of today's Catholic Church? I share the same opinions that Martin has. It broke my, broke all of our hearts to watch the abuse of the young that the church was doing. It is, It was a terrible thing. The Catholic Church must make major changes. They have to adapt to helping the young. They have to show the way. They have to make the young believe that there truly is a path to heaven, and it is how they live their lives. They have to lessen the importance of the sacraments of the church. They have to make it so that the young want to attend. That will not be an easy thing for them. Are there any other ways that you would choose to increase the membership of the church? I share the thought that it all comes down to how the church treats the young. The young are the, is the, are the future of the world. If evil overtakes the young, then evil will overtake the world, and evolution will be threatened. Have no doubt. The churches have got to be a place where people want to go. They want to have the social interaction. They want to feel the energies of others that believe in God. It's all very simple. You simply have to make church a place that people want to attend. Your teachings follow the church doctrine of the 12th century. What would you consider the greatest error that you made in your teachings? The fact that every word of the Bible was correct. The fact that there was a a burning hell. There were many things of which I spoke which are not true. I based it on the information that was available to me. Now that I'm over here, I have a true understanding of the way of things. Okay, you were talking about the continuance of the sacraments and the confessions and the communion all uh, kind of taking people away from the church. What do you think would be conductive or conducive to bringing the future members back to the church? The people that have left are going to be very hard to bring back. They have been turned off. Many of the churches are, many of the Catholic churches in particular, are in financial problems due to the liabilities of what they allowed their priests to do. It's going to be very hard to bring those people back, but they must appeal to the young. The young want to worship God, the young don't want to live lives of, of sin, of drugs. They have to, the church simply has to be a place where the young want to go. Yeah. With the rise of evil that we're seeing today, do you think organized religions will exist far into the future? Or do you think they'll be overtaken by the evil? It is quite possible that evil will overtake organized religions. People may well decide that they want to just simply follow God on their own, that they know what is best for their own pl- uh, own path and that they don't need an organized religion to help them on that path. The churches have got to make people realize that they are there to guide them, not to tell them what to do, but to guide them, to give them suggestions, to give them information that will help them do good, to offer charities where they can help assist, to understand the true happiness of helping others. If the church does that, then they will have a good chance to exist far into the future. What do you think is the greatest danger to the growth of organized religions? When organized religions tell the people exactly what they have to do for salvation, then they are creating a great sin themselves. 
they have to make it so that under the people understand that each path is separate there is no universal path to heaven each individual must do what they must do to help arrive in the realms of heaven in advance okay uh, one of our listeners said, do you have any d- advice on how we can lead people to the modern words? Especially those people that don't believe in channeling. You know, we, we've put out a whole book that's basically written by God. But people are saying, uh-uh. It's very hard for people to believe that there are actually messengers, true messengers of God that speak his words. You have to focus on the words, on the messages. The channeled messages that you're hearing are very simple. Go to the people. Help advise them. Help them to understand that these words are not words that do not have limitations. Let them know that they are words of advice. They are words of guidance. Tell them to listen to the words, not to... Do not think about the source, but to listen to the messages themselves and to live according to those messages. Sometimes if you don't tell people that they are channeled words, but they are preachings, you will do much better. It is very difficult to understand that God can still speak and you can hear these words. Yes. What needs to be done concerning the abuse problem that has plagued the Catholic Church? They have to pay the karma for what they've done. They have to compensate the individuals that are, har- are harmed. They have to give them guidance. They have to do all of the things to cure the ills. They created a sin. Their sin is no different than an individual's. They must pay the karma. Okay. St. Francis, thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate conversing with you. Do you have a final message for everybody? Yes. I want you to understand just how simple it is to follow the words of God. It is common sense. The messages that he brings you each week, they're common sense words. All you have to do is live a good life. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you don't want anger shown at you, don't show anger. Focus on the younger people, the younger generations. Babies are born with no tendencies, with no knowledge. They are born to be taught. As a child advances, show them an environment of love, of understanding, of compassion, of helping others. When you drive by a homeless person with that child, don't laugh at that person. Tell the child that he is like everyone else, that he has just had some bad luck, that he is to be pitied, that he is to be helped. Educate the child in a manner in which he understands the words of God. Today, many of your institutions are leading people away from God. When the professor is an atheist, how can anything good come of that? It can't. When people do things that are harmful, the best example today is Russia invading an innocent country and killing all these wonderful young men and women and children. That is truly truly a sin against human mankind. The people that do that will will pay greatly when they return to heaven. Their karma will be massive. We will not be aware of what takes place, but you can rest assured that God will not, not rest until those individuals are sent to the lowest level, and for thousands of years they will contemplate the evil that they have done. Do not fear death. 
Death is the beginning of your soul life. Death is not the end. It's only humans that think death is the end. Those of us over here all understand that death is when the soul returns to heaven and when it begins anew. The slate is wiped clean. Do not fear God because of things that you've done in the past. God is very forgiving. From this day forward, follow his words, do his bidding, help others, show love. There are many, many things that can help you ease the path through life. Human lives aren't easy. We all know that. We all lived them. That's why we can speak of them. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I hope that I will be invited back. So thank you. Oh, I think there's a good chance of that, St. Francis. Thank you. Okay, guys. That was very, very interesting. I loved it. Now, next week, we're going to be channeling three famous atheists. We will talk to David Ben-Gurion. He was the first Jewish prime minister of Israel, and he was an atheist. I didn't think you had Jewish atheists, but that was a surprise. We'll speak with Thomas Edison and Karl Marx. It should be really interesting to find out what these guys saw when they closed their eyes on that final day. On Tuesday morning at 9 p.m. Pacific time on Voice America Variety Network, Connie and I are doing a radio show entitled Spirit Speak, Analyzing the Afterlife. Please tell your friends and join us. We are covering all sorts of interesting subjects on the show. Your friends will thank you. You can submit questions, suggestions for future channeling history guests through our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. My eighth book, Messages of God for a Modern World, available in English and Spanish as a soft cover and ebook on Amazon. It's a compilation of 60 messages from Jesus that we channeled on our Wednesday morning podcast. It's a great devotional. It's the, some of the messages are just incredible. Please tell your friends about it. I guarantee they'll thank you. The book is available on Kindle. You can download it in both English and Spanish. Signed copies are only available on my website, barrystrom.com. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel, to my name. If you want to download them, go to Podomatic and search Channeling History. I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and God bless every one of you. Uh, Connie, well spoken. Now, we've also got a new podcast. Our weekly message from Jesus is now two years old. That's where we get all these wonderful messages. So we hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Thank you for listening. Please join us on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern time on the Parax Radio Network. And please make sure you tell all of your friends about our show. So thank you and good night. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.